You're listening to Pro Community, a Socius podcast, the show where online community meets business performance. of Pro Community. I'm Josh Paul and I'm seeing an increasing number of uh, blog posts and webinars on online communities but this is the show where online community meets business performance. You can see all the past episodes of Pro Community at socius.com where you can also leave comments uh, about each show. You can also subscribe to the show in an audio podcast format on iTunes. I'm very pleased to have with me today Paul Resnick, professor at the University of Michigan School of Information and co-author of the new book, Building Successful Online Communities, Evidence-Based User Design. Is it user design or is it social design? Social design. Evidence-based social design. Evidence-based social design. It's a great book. Everybody check it out. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thanks for being on the show. Good to be here. Thank you. Here's the book. Oh, perfect. We'll link to it in the show notes, and uh, I encourage everybody who's serious about online communities to get the book. But I want to start, Paul, by talking about how you found yourself at the intersection of social science and economics and technology, and, and how did all of those come together to point you towards online communities? Uh, sure. Uh, my, my PhD is in computer science, but after that I started working with economists and political scientists and psychologists on various applications of computing to making groups of people function better together. I, I created one of the first recommender systems, things that have now grown into, you know, Amazon, people who like this also, or people who bought this book also bought, or Netflix's uh, movie recommenders. Uh, and uh, I, I connected with Bob Kraut, a colleague who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon. I'm at the University of Michigan. Uh, and we put together a team, I guess, you know, maybe eight years ago now, uh, to study uh, online communities. And in particular, we started with the question of how to get people to, to make contributions, to give things to the online communities, not just take from them. Uh, and it seemed like there were theories from economics that could help, theories about public goods provision and what gets people to contribute to public goods, but also a lot of theories from psychology around how to motivate people uh, by appealing to uh, their desire for connection, by appealing to uh, social comparisons that uh, people don't want to feel like they're below average. Like that. Now, I want to get into the, the some of your findings on what drives contribution, but first I want to start out by you know, at a higher level. You your research or You research and you educate current and, and future business leaders on the power and the design of online communities. What are the fundamental elements of a successful online community? Uh, well, I guess the successful elements of, a, of an online community are people, content in some way for people to interact with each other around content. Uh, I think of the, the fundamental challenges to doing it well uh, are um, Getting people to do the good stuff, the contribution thing that we've already talked about, uh, regulating behavior, preventing kind of things that you don't want to have happen, uh, getting people to be committed to the community, uh, and then uh, things around the, the startup. So the startup for a new individual member, so the onboarding process, uh, and uh getting a new community started when you don't yet have the members, how to, how to attract a critical mass. I think those are the, the big challenges. Now, I'm going to kind of reverse our, our questions here. I said I'd get into it, contributions next, but you, br- you brought up a good point. One of the biggest challenges that organizations have, and we're getting a lot of calls from companies who want to start 
user groups and want to build an online customer community uh, using our platform. But you know, how do companies get started? What advice do you have about companies who are planning to launch an online community? What are those those crucial even before the community is launched, what are those things that the ducks that a company has to get in a row or an organization has to get in a row to make this a success? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, you know, first thing is, you know, as with any kind of product, you have to get a clear sense of value proposition. Who's it for and why are they going to want to participate? Uh, you have to have some distribution channel to, to reach those people who, who are going to value participating in it. So I, I, I think of those things as sort of finding a niche the community uh, and uh, then it's, it's worth doing some some amount of work to think through the um, who else is competing in that niche and sort of what are the strategic things of do you want to be importing content from do you want to be partnering or competing with the very other various other players in the niche uh, and are you going to have something so that when it turns out that your community is really successful that's going to keep people staying with your community rather than something to to another. So those are the sort of strategic things around carving out a niche and making sure you'll be able to defend it. And then there are things around getting to critical mass. So, you know, what are you going to do to make the first person who comes to your community want to participate even though you don't have all the other people that you're hoping to eventually have? Because you don't want to have this sort of sequential situation of the first person comes and says, ah, it looks like nothing much is happening here, and they leave. The next person comes and says the same thing, but if they had all sort of come together, they would have uh, liked meeting each other and, and interacting there. That's exactly how, how we talk about it to, to companies and, and membership organizations. So it's really good to hear you talk about it that way. We talk about kind of the two parts, creating value for your customer, for your member. You know, why are they going to come here in the first place? Why are they going to take time out of their busy day to check out this community and determine in the first few seconds that, hey, it's worth exploring. There may be something of value in here for me. And then the second part is creating the processes and using the, the functionality in the community to create a system of ongoing engagement, keep them coming back to the community, letting them know when new, fresh content is that's relevant to them is added to the community. Right. And in the startup phase, there's a special problem that, that some of that value you're hoping other community members are cre- going to create in the very early stages the other community members aren't there to, to create that so you got to think about things that might substitute for that in the early days absolutely like professionally produced content or something like that. absolutely a lot of um i think a lot of organizations fall down on the content side they, they think it's strictly a social play and if you build it people will find each other and connect and miraculously start very insightful, meaningful, valuable conversations. But a lot of that in the first six months to even a year um, is people come to the community for exclusive content driven, you know, created by the organization or those very close to the sponsoring organization. Um, and, and then so they come for the content and then the community builds over time. Do you find that as well? Well, it, it can work different ways, but I think that's sort of the easiest they come for the content, or they can come for the commerce, or they can come for the jokes. There's something that's there initially, um, and it needs to be, if, if the other members aren't there in efficient numbers yet, then you've got to do something to make sure that you're providing it, at least temporarily, and then that you have a way of stepping out so that you're not stuck always providing it. Absolutely. It, and it's, I mean, that, that phase is so critical. I, I think I'd called it the, the chicken and the egg model where people come to the you know community and if they don't see activity, they don't see value, they're not going to stick around the community. So then the next people who come to the community don't see members in the community uh, participating and it, it spirals from there. So which do you need first? Members or engagement, but then you need members in order to get engagement. It's, it's a big circle. Right. Uh, so let's talk about engaging new members. You know, one of the hardest processes for businesses or, or membership organizations is to design um, a way of engaging newcomers. You know, um, they need to be treated differently in that time, as we just talked about, is very critical in building value for the, the community members and commitment to the community. What are some of the evidence-based tips for setting up an onboarding process? 
one of the things we try to do um, in that newcomers chapter of the book is to, to look at what's happened in offline organizations for onboarding projects. What, what do we know uh, about what's worked and what hasn't worked for the army and for uh, business organizations and for voluntary, voluntary organizations. And there's, there's a long history of, of, uh, of organization research uh, in this area. Uh, some, of the, some of the suggestions are sort of widely uh, applied already in online communities, some of them not. One of the ones that struck me as being very rarely used and potentially there might be ways to, in some kinds of communities to use it more is to uh, bring newcomers on in cohorts rather than as individuals. So, uh, you know, some kinds of online communities, that's just not going to be possible. People show up and they want something right then. You can't tell them to wait until you've got 20 new people. But there, I think there's some kinds, especially, you know, uh, an internal uh, uh social network inside a large company, for example, where you could bring people on in cohorts and have act, have sort of uh, collective socialization rather than individual socialization instead of things for, uh, all, you know, all the people in one work group to do together to, to join the community rather than having them join one at a time. I hadn't heard that before. That That's uh, really interesting. I'm thinking through right now how that can be applied in... Uh, Kind of in customer communities and user group communities and ex external communities. That's really uh, a yeah. Good it might be takeaway. you know it might be harder for a customer community because you know the customer is coming because their product isn't working or they're thinking about buying the product and they're not going to wait around to get initiated with everybody else. But but maybe it, it's certainly worth thinking about. There are, Absolutely. When it, when it's possible to do it in cohorts, there there are some big advantages there. Um, there are uh, other kinds of socialization tactics uh, that are worth thinking about. Things that um, that uh, sort of uh, the, the equivalent of the hazing ritual, right? Where if uh, people go through something where they have to do some work, uh, then they have a lot more commitment to the community afterwards. The challenge, of course, is if you make it too unpleasant, then they're not going to go through it. But if, if there's something where, if there's some early point where people have a lot of enthusiasm, uh, then you could capitalize on that to have people do something that may be challenging or difficult, but that will increase their commitment to the community for, for having done that. It's like an online community boot camp? Yes. Yeah. 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 Which, which sort of usually is combined with the, the collective experience. You, you go through boot camp together. But but it could you can imagine doing it as a as an individual as well. I think those are both great. That's a really goals. challenging task, uh, and um, you know especially if the tasks that you give people are things that are uh, actually helpful in the community. So, what what's an example like, of something that you've uh, seen or something that could be done? I. Uh, I mean, is it like creating a, you know, blog post on your expertise or um, yeah, even so filling out a profile? Um, it could be filling out a profile. Um, I have in mind more things that are, um, that are sort of tasks, that are introductions to the, to the work of the community. So uh, if you're... If it's a technical Q and A site, uh, find a question that you can answer. Okay. And maybe the site helps you do something to, to find that first question that's easy enough for a newcomer to answer. Uh, if you're uh, coming into Wikipedia as an editor, uh, helping you find the the first valuable contribution that you can make, which may be uh, proofreading something, or it may be checking a reference. A citation to something. So finding something, some uh, meaningful task that is uh, small enough and uh, requires little enough expertise that, that the newcomer can do it, then sort of pulls the, that newcomer into, into the life of the community. 
mean, it, it makes them uh, be a, a legitimate participant, somebody who can see a trajectory for themselves of, of getting to be a full member. And the community gets a, the double reward of, of somebody uh, increasing their commitment to the community, but by doing something that adds value to the community itself. I really right. like that. And of course, it's this is not an easy thing to do to find something that's that that is interesting and doable by a newcomer who doesn't really know the community yet. So that's the that's why it that's why it's not done so much. But but uh, if you set that as a challenge for yourself as a community designer, I think you can often find something that would work that way. I think that that's a great place where uh, online community managers can uh, have a significant impact. So in your experience, what role does monitoring and moderation and, and overall community management play in successful online communities? Yeah, so uh, I, this is uh, this problem of, so there, there's two things that an online community manager can do. One thing is to try to uh, prevent bad things from happening, step in when they do. The other is to try to draw people out, uh, be a hostess and and get people to, uh, to to be to be the kind of person they wanted to be in the community, and, and that they make the contributions that they can make. Uh, I think we tend um, to think perhaps too much about the first role of preventing bad things from from happening. Uh, it there are some some communities where it's really necessary, and I I've done. A lot of work actually on, on trying to think about manipulation resistance in recommender systems, for example, where someone's going to create twenty thousand accounts in order to, you know, manipulate the recommendations of, of what products people see. But in a in a community setting, uh, uh, where it's actual people who are interacting, so assuming you can keep the bots out, uh, and you're actually dealing with people, uh, then the uh, in most settings. Um, a light touch seems to work very well. That uh, that uh, the having lots of rules and and banning people and and things like that are uh, often not so helpful. They they create a reaction of uh, I'm going to show you I can do this and I can come back with a different account and and you'll have to put all your energy into into stopping me. Whereas the philosophy of uh, uh, let me give you a face-saving way out. You might not have realized this, but uh, someone using your account posted this thing. Uh, and uh, we don't really talk to each other that way in this community. If, you, if your account has been compromised and you'd like to, to reset it, let, let us know. And, uh, and often people will, uh, will, will, will take the face-saving way out and, oh yeah, I, I didn't mean to do that, or or you know, perhaps you didn't know, but uh, but uh, we, we generally uh, try not to yell at, at newcomers here, and instead, this is the kind of language we use, and, and people will usually uh, respond to those kind of gentle, gentle products. There are a few other things that are sort of uh, common tricks that that help. Uh, there are some people who do like to fight, and uh, giving them a place to do that that doesn't disturb everybody else can often be helpful. So various online communities have done some version of, uh, you know, an off-topic space or a, a fight space or a take it outside space, or you know, they have different names for it. But but some place that where you can say, yeah, it's okay to do that. Just don't do it here. Let me move you over with this activity that that uh, is of interest only to a few people. Let let's move it to some place that's not going to bother everybody. I think those are. Those are do it. Those are great tips. I mean, I think that's one of the things, you know, when, when you follow the online community management, uh, Twitter chats and, and some of the major blogs, dealing with conflict is one of the hardest things that community managers have to face. And um, you just gave two or three really good um, you know, tangible ways that people can do that and they can put it into practice fairly quickly. Interesting, because while it's, while it's a big... Um, energy sink for the online community manager, it's actually only a, a very small fraction of what's going on in the community. And so it's also important to not lose sight of the fact that that, that, that isn't the main thing and, 
and uh, it, it's good if you can set up some kind of mechanism that allows the online community manager to put some of their attention not on the problem but on the opportunity and I, I think a, a really important role for online community managers is just welcoming new people figuring out how to get them integrated the you know once once they you've introduced them to people who are the right people to for them or you've given them some tasks that they they are, they now have something that they've done in the community and they'll you know often be able to keep going on their own but that that very first step is critical and having it be either a community manager or volunteers who are in this uh, welcome bandwagon explicit role can be can be really helpful and so you know, I would definitely encourage putting attention into the uh, the, the positive things uh, and the, the opportunities and not just resolving the problems. No, I, I completely agree. A lot of people you know, look at it as being proactive versus reactive. And the more that you can uh, set up processes to deal with the, the reactive stuff and spend less of your energy and time there and more on proactively um, bringing people into the community and growing the community and giving uh, providing value to those in the community, the more successful you are going to be as a community manager, the more successful the community will be. Yeah. So in your research, let's get back to the, the concept of driving contributions. In your research, what are the drivers behind contributions in an online community? Yeah, so we have, uh, and again here, this is, uh, we're drawing on research in the offline world of uh, what gets people to contribute to what economists call public goods, things where somebody does the effort but everybody gets the benefit. And there's a tendency to, for there to be under contribution because of that. Uh, the, um, we can think of it in, in terms of uh, what we call this collective effort model, things that increase the um, value to the individual or things that make the individual more effective at making the at, at creating value for the community uh, and uh, making the individual feel that, that their contribution to that is especially important so one of the principles is the uniqueness principle that uh, if people are convinced that they're the only one that can can do it, they're much more likely to do it than if lots of people, if they think that lots of people can do it. You see that in uh, if you make a request and you say, hey, can anybody in the community uh, answer this question versus, hey, Josh, can you answer this question? You're going to be much more likely to answer a question that's directed specifically at you than one that's directed at a whole lot of people. And there's actually, a, you know, everywhere in between is basically a declining. Uh, more people who are the recipients of the ask, the less likely each individual recipient is to respond to it. So that's just in sort of who's, who's uh, it, you know, in making a, an ask. Uh, but there's also the content of the ask. Do, do you emphasize that, uh, you know, the reason I'm asking you is that, uh, you have some special expertise and or you seem to be the one who's most interested in this so could I get you to do it uh, so the, the, the sense that that you have some unique capability or, or interest that that uh, that other people it's not redundant with the effort that, that other people are going to make we did an experiment on this we actually um, there was a, a movie writing site called movie lens think of Netflix but without the movies. You just rate the mov rate movies and it suggests other movies, but it doesn't actually deliver the movies to you. And uh, this is this is some years ago now, probably seven years ago that we ran this experiment, but um, uh, they, they weren't getting enough ratings of the un unpopular movies. They were getting plenty of ratings of the popular movies, but if they wanted to make good predictions about who would like the less popular movies, they needed more ratings of those. Uh, so we were trying to, we did a campaign where we were emailing people who were already members of the site saying, hey, could you rate some more movies? And we selected sort of identical people, people who had rated, identi not identical, but people who had 
were similar in their in their profile of, of movies they'd rated in the past. Some blockbusters, some unusual movies. Uh, and we sent these email messages, please, could you rate some more movies? Some of the people, we said, uh, we, we're asking you because you've rated popular movies like X, Y, and Z. And we took X, Y, and Z from their own profile, the movies that they had rated. And other people, we said, we selected you because you, you've rated um, less popular movies like A, B, and C. And we chose those from their profiles. But the people weren't really different. They, they weren't, they, well, we didn't target the people who had on block would rated blockbusters or targeted the people who rated unusual movies. Um, we there was the same population, but we emphasized different things. So some of them we emphasized how unique they were in in uh, rating unusual movies versus other people. We emphasized how similar they were to, to the population as a whole. And you could intuitively you could make an argument that either one of those might be persuasive. Right? Oh, I'm more like everybody, therefore that's why they needed me. Or I'm unique, and that's why they needed me. But empirically, it turns out that uh, telling people how unique they are, that is, they rated the, un the, 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 the not-so-popular movies, that made them rate more, okay. which is in line with the prediction that we, we got from the, the social psychology going in. So it was interesting to see that it actually, it actually works there. That's an outstanding uh, bit of research and that has a lot of implications across you know, for-profit and non-profit online communities, uh, online communities of all sorts. Are those, does that same principle apply to creating repeat, uh, repeat engagement in, with an online community? You know, if you're reaching out to somebody, uh, asking them to participate, asking them to come back if they haven't been in the community for a while, the, the more, uh, does the uniqueness principle apply there as well? I would expect it to. I don't have I don't have an experiment to do uh, the site there, but but the, the theory is, is pretty general that that when you're trying to get people to make contribution, emphasizing what they can do that that is uh, special, uh, that not duplicated by everybody else, should be helpful. So, for example, uh, if you're if you're trying to get people to do more things and they've already done things in the past, then then uh, reminding them of uh, of the fact that they made this, they made special contributions in the past, should be helpful. Uh, I think that's you know marketers are listening to this right now, and and, and taking that note, underlining it until their the tip of their pencil breaks because that that right there, whether it's participation in an online community, uh, it's really you know moving, uh, influencing behavior. Uh, of any sort, and, and I think that's a really good principle. What What are some of the uh, common mistakes that you see organizations make when designing online communities? Common mistakes. Um, I think one of the one of the mistakes is um, putting too much effort initially into preventing bad things from happening. Uh, generally, the bad things are going to happen only after your community is interesting enough for someone to come along and want to mess it up. Uh, you have to have you have to have something before there's before there's before a troll wants to see if they can mess it up. Uh, so ha having some thought about how you're going to deal with those problems when they come is helpful up front. But uh, Almost anything that you do that that is trying to proactively prevent it is going to have some negative effect as well on the people who are who are trying to make it run well. And you can't really afford to alienate those people or get get in their way uh, early on. Uh, so I would say have something in your back pocket for dealing with the conflict, but don't um, don't put any roadblocks in the way of positive contributions up front. That would be one, I think, common mistake. That makes sense. Now, a, a lot of what you focus on is finding ways or, or finding out what fuels productive social relationships online. Uh, and, and you use that data in the design of other online communities. What are some of the characteristics of a pr productive social relationship? 
Uh, so uh, I guess I've, I've used that phrase, productive social uh, relations, and maybe you're you're grabbing that from some of my website or whatever. Um, uh, by that I mean um, anything where where people are getting something from each from each other. They may be exchanging information. They may be uh, they may be providing social support. They may be selling stuff to each other on, on eBay. And I, um, you know, one of the things that I think un underlies that is is trust. So I've especially been interested in uh, how can we trust strangers? Trusting our friends is something that sort of works out naturally. You figure out which, you, you interact with somebody a lot, you figure out when they're going to be trustworthy and when they're not. Probably if they're never going to be trustworthy, they're not your friend, but if, if you, you figure out which settings they're, they're likely to come through and in which one's not, and you have your own personal history with them. It's the, it's the in the online arena we have the opportunity to to interact with people that we haven't interacted with before and uh, and so I, I've been very interested in in uh, how reputation some information from how of what happened when other people interacted with with, with this person that you're thinking about interacting with um, how can that be uh, helpful both as an indicator of what that person is like and as a as proactively as something that um, creates an incentive for them to behave well. So if you think about eBay's reputation system, for example, it's, uh, it's working in two ways. One is that uh, people are looking at it to decide, did I buy from this guy? And uh, if, uh, if he has a good reputation, maybe I should buy from him. And if he doesn't have a good reputation, maybe I should skip it and not buy from him. So it's a, it's a way of uh, signaling which which of the uh, which of the sellers is safe, but it's also uh, uh, creating an incentive for the seller to do a good job in this transaction because they don't want me to give them a bad feedback. They do want they do want me to give them a good feedback because other people in the future are going to be looking back at that reputation. So it's it's creating the shadow of the future to uh, to make people behave in the present. I've never really thought about reputation systems as, as being so important to building that trust, building that productive relationship where, where it's a win-win a for you know, customers, employees, partners, whoever's in the, in the community, but a, a reputation system being a major driver of building that trust. I, I like that. In, in a lot of online communities, you're starting to see um, some kind of metrics of as participation by the user. And that's sometimes done sort of as badging systems or leveling systems to encourage people to do a lot of stuff. But it's also used to, to try to help other people decide, oh, is this somebody that it's reasonable to ask? Is, is this somebody whose advice I should take? When they tell me, uh, when they tell me uh, something about how to operate in this community, and I see that they joined last week versus they joined a year ago and they have 10,000 posts. I, I can calibrate a little bit, uh, you know, how much I want to I want to believe them. That That's interesting. Does gamification play a role in that where, you know, people earn certain badges by achieving, you know, certain trust? worthy uh, or doing certain trustworthy actions whether it's a post whether it's uh, a certain rating by other users is that something that that plays a part in building a reputation in an online community it can if you just if you have the right metrics used for doing the badging so the the badges are, are point systems they're they're very popular now and i think mostly they've been thought of as sort of um incentives for the person who's getting the badge, not as information for other people who's, who are looking at those badges. The, um, in order to be effective incentives, it's, it can be, you have to think that through too, uh, because uh, 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 any, with any uh, system of metrics, people start playing to the metric. So You're if right. it's uh, if it's uh, if it's just counting the number of posts, 
then people put in a lot of short posts. That, that makes uh, sense. And if if it's counting time to respond, then people put in very quick responses, but not good responses. If it's if it's counting number of likes that other people give to your post, then you start asking all of your friends to <laughs> click on the like button on all of your posts. So all of these things have the potential to be gamed. Uh, the and we have some you know we have some suggestions about how to how to re reduce the amount of gaming will happen. Okay. The, of course, the, the best best way to prevent gaming is to have the metric actually measure the thing that you care about. And then the only way to improve the metric is to do the thing that, that you're, is the behavior that you're trying to encourage. Uh, but I, I think if you, uh, that's not always so easy to do or even possible. Uh, but you can try to get close to that uh, and you can try to have various breaks on things that make it hard to create lots of accounts or make it obvious that uh, you know or make it that you only only get one like per friend per day or you know things like that I, I think it would be helpful uh, if you're if someone's designing some kind of gamification system is to think about not only what is the impact on the person who's receiving the badges but what information does it provide to other people in the community and try to make it so that those badges are actually informative one of the nice side effects, in addition to being informative, is people will actually care more about badges than everybody else cares about. So it, it, it's more valuable to me to get, you know, a Super Bowl ring than a than a Pee Wee football ring, and uh, because you know because it's a bigger accomplishment, and the things that that are going to be noticed by other people are are more effective as badges. That makes sense. It kind of flips it on its head where instead of the individual caring about the badge, uh, if you, you see more, uh, it's better for the entire community to care about the badge that they see on that individual's profile. That, that makes sense. I'll, I want to wrap this up with one last question. I usually, you know, ask for kind of the, if you're speaking to a group of executives, you know, what would the one takeaway about online communities be? But I want to flip it around a little bit, and I mean, you, if you if you look at your schedule, I don't know if there's anybody in the country who teaches more students about online communities than you do. So when you're, you know, teaching a semester on designing online communities and the promise and power of online communities, what is the one takeaway that you want students to leave your class with when it's all over? The, the big takeaway that I want students to leave the class with is that they can make explicit design decisions that will shape what happens in the community. They can't, they can't control what will happen. You can't just make the community do what you want, but you are far from powerless. Uh, and the even small decisions can have big impacts. So thinking through carefully uh, lots of design decisions that are both technical and social around what kind of moderation and, and policies you put in place, that those things will have, will make a big difference. And those so uh, students that you're teaching are the future business leaders of, you know, of the world. And I mean, that, that takeaway right there applies to business people and executives right now. So were you going to add, um, add a little bit more about that? No, I was just going to say it's sort of the designer's perspective uh, is you have to have you have to know your power, but also be humble. That's and, a, uh, you have you have more power than, than you may realize and less than you might like. That's a that's a really good point. You know, as, as there's a lot of confusion and hype and um, trepidation around launching an online community or or an online user community. Uh, the idea that you have more power than you think you do uh, is really, really important. Well, Paul, I want to thank you for uh, sharing your insight today and uh, in your experience. Before we go, where can people find you on the web? Um, you can find my uh, my homepage is uh, at uh, best way is Google Paul Resnick, University of Michigan, 
and uh, you'll you'll get directed to that homepage. And uh, yeah, that's great. Well, the book is Building Successful Online Communities, Evidence-Based Social Design. We'll link to it in the show notes. As always, you can see past episodes of Pro Community at Socius.com, uh, where you can also subscribe to the show as an audio podcast in iTunes, where good reviews and five-star ratings are always appreciated. Paul, I want to thank you once again. Have a great day. Thank you.